Hello and welcome to the fifth and final part of lesson seven. In the last part of this lesson, we looked at the phenomenon of viscous dissipation, essentially the internal friction that is present within a flowing highly viscous liquid. What we're going to do in this part of lesson seven is to see how to solve the energy equation when we have a volumetric heat source such as viscous dissipation present. In order to do this analytically, we're going to have to make quite a few simplifying assumptions. These assumptions may start to look a little unrealistic, but the final result is useful, as it can be used to check whether a more complex numerical solution to a real problem is capturing the basic behaviour that we know should happen. So, let's start about thinking about this highly simplified problem. So, I'm going to look at a simple Cartesian geometry and I'm going to look at flow in one dimension. So we're looking at one dimensional flow in a slot. So these are the types of problems that you will have seen before when you solve the Navier-Stokes equations for the first or second time. So let's add some dimensions onto my slot. Let's say I've got a symmetry line uh, in the center there, and I'm going to place my Cartesian axes on that symmetry line because I know that at y equals zero, I've got a zero gradient condition, and that makes boundary conditions easy to evaluate. I'm going to have a half width of my slot B, so my entire thickness of material or my entire thickness of flow is 2B. I've got a length L, and across that length L there is a pressure drop delta P. So we're going to solve the Navier-Stokes equations for this flow. I'm going to assume that we've got a Newtonian flow, or a generalised Newtonian flow if you wish. So the assumptions that I make for the flow is I've got an x-direction velocity only, that that velocity field just varies with y, and that the walls represent stationary boundaries. So there's no slip boundary conditions at the upper and lower wall at y equals plus or minus b, and the velocity is zero on those walls. I'm going to make some more assumptions as well. So I'm going to assume that we've got a steady flow going on, that it's essentially a non-inertial flow. So the Reynolds numbers are small, so I've got a laminar flow. My geometry is horizontal, so I'm going to ignore gravity, and I'm going to assume a Newtonian rheology. Moreover, I'm going to assume a Newtonian rheology that does not vary with temperature. That's a really big simplifying assumption. But if we think about what we're trying to achieve, which is an idealised solution that we can use to check numerical data against later, in a numerical solution we can turn off that temperature dependence and we can see if this basic result has been achieved. So the fact that we are assuming that viscosity doesn't vary with temperature doesn't lessen the usefulness of this result in terms of a validation to a numerical solution. So we'd set up the Navier-Stokes equations and we can solve them. I'm not going to go through this. We did this in previous lessons. You can do this. I have no doubt about that. What we obtain is that my flow velocity Vx is a parabola. It's a function of y squared. OK, no surprises there. Um, what I'm going to do is just repose this slightly, because what I'd like to do is to have a simple solution that doesn't involve pressure drops or pressure drops per unit length. I'm simply going to say that my parabolic velocity profile can be described by a maximum velocity, which occurs on the centre line, and that that velocity drops to zero at each of the walls. And I can simply rewrite Vx is going to be V max over B squared, B squared minus Y squared, and if you're in any doubt as to the validity of that, if we set y equals zero, that's on the centre line, we'd expect the maximum velocity. And that's exactly what we do see because the two b squared terms cancel out. And at the walls, we'd expect zero velocity where y equals b and we get within the brackets b squared minus b squared. Therefore, velocity is zero. Fine. OK, so that is a valid way of also writing that velocity profile. Just to make things nice and easy and to be able to relate the solution that we get to something a bit more physically real, I want to now define a mean velocity. Now, the mean velocity is simply going to be the velocity that I would obtain if I said, let's just divide volumetric flow rate by area through which that volumetric flow is going. So Q over A in parametric terms. And the way I'm going to define that mean velocity for this geometry is to say, well, look, let's just integrate my velocity profile between the centre line and one of the walls and then divide by that wall, th by that um, thickness, that half thickness. So I'd write V bar, mean velocity, is going to be 1 over B, the integral between 0 and B of Vx as a function of y, dy. 
And if I make do that integration, what I get is this functionality here. So my x direction velocity is 3 halves times the mean velocity over b squared multiplied by b squared minus y squared. And so that's a result I'm going to use quite extensively in the solution as we develop it. All right, so that is my flow field. I've solved the momentum equation with a Newtonian rheology to get my flow field for this effectively 1D flow. Now let's examine the energy equation. So when we solve the energy equation, we've got our little workflow we go through, and we're going to do that now. We're going to draw a picture, and we're going to figure out what's going on. So there, at step one, is my picture of the heat transfer problem. And so my heat transfer problem involves conduction, it involves advection, because I've got a moving fluid, and it involves heat generation due to thermal dissipation. So I'm going to also furthermore assume that I've got constant temperature walls, and I'm going to think about what that means for my model, my mental model. So I've got heat generation, that heat generation is in form of viscous dissipation. Viscous dissipation happens in high shear regions. The high shear region in this case is at the walls. So I would expect initially the temperature of the fluid to heat up near the walls in that high shear zone. And I'd expect zero viscous dissipation on the centre line. I'm looking for the steady state solution, one that's long away from sort of entrance effects or, ent or exit effects. So I'm going to assume I've got an infinitely long slot and examine how the temperature profile develops along the long slot. So initially at the start of flow, I'd expect sort of a temperature peak near the walls because that's where I've got the viscous dissipation happening. OK, but I've got heat conduction going on. So I would expect that temperature to peak to move towards the lower temperature part, which is towards the centre of the flow. My wall temperature is going to remain unchanged because I've specified my wall temperature. So I've always got T equals Tw at the top and bottom of this slot. And so all the energy that's generated in that high shear zone at the top and at the bottom of the slot diffuses inwards. And so I might get two thermal peaks, two peaks of high heat near the walls to start with, one at the top, one at the bottom. I can't heat my walls up because my walls are constant temperature. What I can do is heat the fluid up internal to those temperature peaks. And so over time, I'd expect the heat to diffuse into the core of the flow. And for the maximum temperature to be found at the core of the flow, once we've reached that um, fully developed solution. OK. All right. And so based on that, my second step is to decide whether I'm doing a one dimensional or two dimensional analysis. Now, ordinarily we'd do a BO number analysis here, but I'm not going to now because what I'm going to assume from the outset is that I'm going to look at the solution to this problem at such a point where everything is fully developed. That is to say that I've only got a gradient across the flow of temperature. The thermal gradient and the velocity gradient are in the same direction. OK, so that's my mental model. That's what I'm expecting to happen. So let's see later on whether it does. So that's step one and step two done. So what we then said with step three was to, well, define your coordinate system. We've chosen Cartesian coordinates. And then to simplify the energy equation, look at it in vector form first, look at the physics first, and then drop the remaining physics that we haven't decided we can get rid of into that coordinate system. So there is my energy transport equation in vector form once again. And let's go through it term by term. So let's start with my heat generation term. I've got one. <laughs> For the first time, I've got one. It's viscous dissipation. I don't have convection and radiation. I do have conduction, but just in the y direction. I'm not dealing with transient effects because I'm looking at a steady state problem. And I do have advection because my fluid is moving with a prescribed velocity field. So those are the terms I have to include in the simplified version of the energy equation in order to solve my problem. So I've got viscous dissipation, I've got heat conduction, and I've got thermal advection. OK, I'm working in Cartesian coordinates. I've got a unidirectional flow. Let's work through and simplify each of these terms. So my viscous dissipation term, 
I've got a unidirectional flow. This is the result that I put on the board in the last bit of the last part of this lesson. So it's mu d by dy of vx all squared. And I know what vx is, so I can work out what that derivative looks like in a minute. I'm neglecting radiation, there isn't any. I'm neglecting convection, there isn't any. I'm looking at the conduction terms next. And I'm making the assumption that everything is fully developed and the only temperature gradient is in the y direction. So I'm just having k d2t by dy squared. I've got a steady state problem. So the only term on the right hand side is the advective term. And let's just write this out quite carefully. My velocity field, I've got an x direction velocity, no y or z direction. So my velocity vector is vx, 0, 0. My temperature gradient, however, doesn't have an x direction gradient because we've assumed everything is fully developed. The only gradient we have is in the y direction, dt by dy. So my temperature gradient vector looks like 0, dt dy, 0. And if I take the dot product of the velocity vector with that temperature gradient vector, I end up with Vx times 0 plus 0 times dt by dy plus 0 times 0. So actually, advection isn't important in this problem, as it turns out. Not in the fully developed flow case. Advection would be important if we had an x direction temperature gradient. But by making this a fully developed problem, there is no longer an x direction, flow direction, temperature gradient. So the equation that we solve is a partial differential equation that I've just put on the board there. It's a balance of conduction and viscous dissipation. And those are the only two things that we need to take into account. All right, so what are we going to do next? Well, the next thing we're going to do is to think about boundary conditions. And so let's have a look what boundaries I've got. I've got my two walls of my flow, my upper wall and my lower flow, lower wall. And I'm going to assume that they're both at the same temperature. T equals T wall. Fine. OK, well, that's nice and straightforward. I've got a second order partial differential equation. So I need two boundary conditions. And having two walls at the same temperature is only one boundary condition because that will be implemented when y equals plus or minus b, but that'll be for the y squared solution. So I need another boundary condition, and that's going to be symmetry. That's why I've placed my axes on the center line of the flow, because when y equals 0, dt by dy equals 0, and that gives me a very easy way to deal with an integration constant. So my boundary conditions are fixed temperature at the walls, zero gradient in the center of the flow. Now. Let's start by looking at that viscous dissipation term, dvx by dy squared. So let's get vx. There's vx. We've already said that my x direction velocity is 3 times the average velocity over 2 times b squared, b squared minus y squared. Let's simply just take the derivative of that with respect to y in order to get my viscous dissipation term. And so I can very easily do that. And I end up with my viscous dissipation term being equal to minus 9 mu v bar squared y squared over b to the 4. And we can simply substitute that in to my partial differential equation. And hey presto, is an ordinary differential equation dt by d, d2t by dy squared equals function of y squared. So there we go. Very simple ordinary differential equation to solve. We can just directly integrate with our boundary conditions, which is great. OK, so there's the equation that I'm solving. There are the boundary conditions that I'm going to use to obtain the solution. It's a simple analytical solution. So let's go ahead and integrate. So we can say that my temperature gradient with respect to y is going to be a result of the first integral. And if we work that through, because of our axis placement, we don't have an integration constant that is anything other than zero. So that gives me an expression for temperature gradient. Let's integrate once again to get my temperature field. And if I do that, I find that my temperature field can be written thus. And what we've got there is a temperature field 
that is a combination of a constant temperature, the wall temperature, plus a term that is quartic in position and is also dependent on square of the velocity. Quite interesting. OK, now we can only get to this analytical solution because of that rather brave assumption that we've made, saying that viscosity is not a function of temperature. Remember we said that this is not going to be the case, but that this solution still has value because in a numerical answer we can turn off the viscosity temperature dependence and look at this idealised analytical solution compared to whatever numerical solution that we've computed. And if they're the same, then typically the code that we've written is going to be mostly correct. OK, so let's have a look at what this means. Let's plot this answer out. We've got linear scaling with mu, we've got a quadratic scaling there with v bar, we've got a quartic scaling with y. Let's plot out various temperature profiles. So on the whiteboard there, I've got on the y-axis my position in the slot as a function of temperature. The physical properties I've used are there on the board as well. And I've got three different curves for three different viscosities, because I really want to emphasise how important viscosity is in determining whether or not viscous dissipation is going to be present. So let's focus on that blue curve. That blue curve is for a viscosity of 100 pascal second. There's not really a temperature gradient, is there? 100 pascal second is still quite a viscous liquid. I mean, if we think of honey being about 1 pascal second, maybe cold honey is of order 100 pascal second or so. So even for something of that viscosity, we don't get a great deal of viscous dissipation. This is why for most fluids that are order of pascal second or less, or order 10 pascal second or less, which is most fluids that you're likely to have encountered up until this point, we've never bothered with it because it's simply not important. If we're dealing with polymeric fluids, however, where polymer melts can have zero shear rate viscosities of order of thousands of pascal seconds, this graph underpins why we're looking at viscous dissipation now. Because if we look at the red curve, which is a zero shear rate viscosity of 10,000 pascal second, which is similar to that of linear low density polyethylene at about 150 degrees C, we can see actually viscous dissipation is a big deal. It makes 10 Kelvin temperature change across our geometry. And if we now think about incorporating that with temperature sensitivity of viscosity, 10 Kelvin actually makes a lot of difference to that viscosity value. So there you have it. For a fluid that isn't temperature dependent in terms of viscosity, these are the temperature profiles that you're likely to get. And the form of them are similar to our mental model. Because remember what we said with our mental model, we thought initially we'd get two peaks of heat in the high shear zone and nothing in the middle, but that over time, as we progress along the flow to that fully developed solution, those peaks of heat are going to diffuse into the middle by conduction. The wall temperature won't change because we've specified the wall temperature. We get a maximum in the centre line because we're symmetric, and that's exactly what we see in this analytical answer. And it's actually a quartic profile rather than a parabolic profile. So the analytical answer corresponds with the mental model, we're quite happy that we understand the problem. All right, I'd like to zoom out a little bit and just put all this into some context. We've looked at the temperature profile for a fluid where viscous dissipation is significant, i.e. a very, very viscous liquid. We've said that viscosity didn't vary with temperature so that we could get an analytical solution to this problem. Additionally, we also assumed that the average velocity was constant. So let's think about a pressure-driven flow. Um, for a pressure-driven flow, viscosity is going to depend, velocity is going to depend on viscosity. And viscosity is going to depend on temperature. And so if viscous dissipation is present, what we need to do is we need to solve the energy dissipation and the momentum equations simultaneously, whilst also maintaining a temperature-dependent viscosity. And so this is a very highly coupled problem to solve which is why we do the Nama Griffiths analysis to make sure that we can safely neglect it or whether or not we can include it. Now, the effect of viscous dissipation is to lower pressure drop. Um, so for extrusion operations, that might help us to a point. Um, but don't forget that if we're thinking about precision extrusion through an extrusion die with fine features, 
you're going to get high shear zones in those fine features, which means you're going to get a drop in viscosity in those high features, which may well eat up, lead to quite a significant flow imbalance through the die. So when we're designing the extrusion dies to um, extrude profiles that may contain small features, lips for example on sections, we need to be thinking carefully how much viscous dissipation is going to be happening, what's the effect of that going to be on the viscosity of the polymer that's going through that die, is that going to generate a flow imbalance and a product distortion. So on one hand you win, lower pressure drops mean lower extrusion energies, but also we lose potentially because of the effect on viscosity and the effect of the flow balance within the extrusion die. The other thing we need to be very, very careful of is materials characterization. And I said in the last part of this lesson, think capillary rheometry, or for that matter, rotational rheometry. We're likely in capillary rheometry to generate very, very high shear rates. That's why we do it. We can attain shear rates we can't easily obtain in rotational rheometry because of the lack of containment of the sample. But those higher shear rates will infer a high Nama Griffith number, which infers viscous dissipation, which infers material near the wall heating up, maybe significantly, which means the viscosity of the material near the wall dropping, possibly quite significantly, which means a lower pressure drop which means that the key values that we're measuring, the key parameters that we're measuring in that rheometry experiment, pressure drop, is not representative of the bulk viscosity. And so if we're looking to get a nice flow curve where we're looking at the effect of shear thinning in a material, we're assuming it's isothermal, but it may not be isothermal due to viscous dissipation. So let's summarize this final part of lesson seven with some key points. We've looked at the simplest case of viscous dissipation where temperature did not affect the velocity field or the viscosity of a flow. We had to solve the momentum equation first to get our velocity field and then the energy equation. We could do it sequentially because it was an uncoupled problem. The result was a cortic temperature profile and we saw that viscous dissipation only manifested once you had very high viscosities or very high velocities. It's usually present in polymer processing flows because of the high viscosities that are typically involved. We also talked about the impact of viscous dissipation on rheometry. We need to do high shear rheometry experiments with our eyes very much open as to whether the assumption of an isothermal flow is valid or not. And that, of course, is where we can use non-dimensional groups such as the Nama Griffith number to assist us with that analysis.